Today, I'm very excited to welcome Terry Tempest Williams to Politics and Prose, celebrating her new collection, Erosion, Essays of Undoing. Williams is a passionate activist and conservationist whose work is rooted in the landscape and the spiritual traditions of the American West. In Erosion, written between 2015 and 2018, she draws on that heritage to help with her weather the twin scourges of Trump and the climate change. The two big ones right now. Um, squarely facing the outrages of the desecration of Bears Ears National Monument, the weakening of environmental laws, and the destruction caused by prolonged drought, Williams turns uh, to art and faith to find ways to endure the grief that we're all losing. Um, and I read this great quote by the amazing Rebecca Solnit that's on the jacket, but I just wanted to share it with you. Uh, Terry Tempest Williams' voice in the clamor is like a hot desert wind blowing away the litter in a crowded room and leaving behind only what has weight, what is essential. It's pretty, pretty great way to state it. Um, Williams is the awarding, award-winning author of The Hour of Land, uh, Personal Topography of America's National Parks, Refuge, An Unnatural History of Family and Place, Finding Beauty in a Broken World, when Women Were Birds, among many other great works. And her work is widely taught and anthologized around the world. Um, she's going to be, not, uh, not conversation, but she's going to be um, having Ross Donahue, who is a, a cartographer and has a map in the book, coming up and talking with her as well. They're going to be sharing some time. Um, so we're excited to see what she has today. So please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Terry Tempest Williams. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. I love this bookstore so much, as you know. And we always have an extraordinary time and conversation together. So thank you for coming out on this beautiful Saturday. It means the world to us. And I just want to pay my respects to Barbara and Carla, um, the original owners. Um, I'm always mindful of, of their presence and spirits and the history that we all share with this exquisite bookstore in, in America. And it's wonderful to be able to now have the tradition of Brad and Lissa and my friend Alan. I feel like the West has joined us. Um, he's an extraordinary bookseller. Um, we met years ago at um, Elliott Bay in Seattle. So book culture is very real. Um, we have an hour together and I am so excited because we're going to share this time. Ross Donahue is so special to me, and this is his home ground. And so we're in for a special treat. And before I introduce you to Ross, I just want to say there are dear, dear friends here. Um, and I want to acknowledge some of you. And um, Francis Raskin is a dear friend of our families. Um, in this book, I write about my brother Dan, whose death by suicide was a heartbreak. And one of Dan's closest friends is Francis. And I want to thank you for the friendship and love that you gave him till the very end. And it's an honor to have you here. Um, Andrew Nalani, thank you. One of the great educators in this country on the planet. And I'm so honored that you're here. And I so appreciate who you are in the world. Hayden Matthews, we go back so long, I can't tell you the joy to see you and your love of birds. And um, years ago, he gave me this beautiful vase of horses, and um, it's always filled with sunflowers. So thank you. Dina Adler is in this book. Um, her, uh, there's a ceremony with she and Colin Peacock, that means the world to me. And it was a very private ceremony. And both of them agreed to allow it to be public. And I really thank you for that. And this is her first week at the Environmental Defense Fund um, as 
I want to say a hot shot. I want to make sure the O, not the I, is there. Um, attorney, attorney, attorney who is protecting power, um, the legalities um, and holding power plants to account. So it's wonderful to see you. And Ethan Friedland, I feel like you are my nephew, and thank you for coming a student here in the D.C. area. I know I'm forgetting people, but just to me, this is what community looks like. Ross Donahue, um, we met in 2015, one of those unexpected gifts. Um, I was giving a talk at with some friends on public lands, George Werthner among them, at the um, Brower Center in Berkeley. And this beautiful, smart um, young man came up and talked about maps, as I remember. And he said, you know, do you, if you ever need a map, I would, that's, I'm a cartographer, and I would love to work together. And I was in the middle, actually toward the end of the Hour of Land, and I desperately needed a map and wanted one, but my publisher had other ideas. Um, and so that didn't come to fruition, but I never forgot Ross. I never forgot his enthusiasm. I never forgot his spirit and commitment to the 640 million acres that belong to all of us and that we know that public lands, before they were public lands, were tribal lands and native lands. Um, and Ross understood the depth of this. And when um, this book came into being, I realized that the most important aspect of these essays um, in this book, Erosion, Essays of Undoing, would be a map. Because if no one read the essays, but they saw the map and really studied the map and the storytelling that that map tells of the gutting of Bears Ears National Monument by 85% um, of the evisceration of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument cut in half, and to see how there's no continuity, that they are islands now, I, I knew that the book would have done what it needed to do. And when I called Ross, who at the time with his partner was working on Maps for Good, he generously said yes. And I think it was a six-month project, was it even a year? And I've never seen such grace. Um, New York has different ideas of landscape, and Ross never faltered, uh, never argued, never um, a cross word. Those came from me. And I learned a lot of what grace really does look like. And um, it's a stunning map. And I would urge you to spend a lot of time with it because it's subtle. Uh, and he's going to talk about that. And what you need to know is, you know, he comes to this um, through his heart and mind. Uh, after 2015, I think it was in 2017, we met again at Yale. He was a student at the Yale School of Forestry. Um, he is a National Geographic explorer. Don't you love that? As one who draws and creates maps is. And he also did some of the elegant maps um, of Patagonia National Park, working with the Tompkins, who um, are really legendary in, in what they've done in Chile and Argentina and the likes. I believe in collaboration. And in those moments when I think all of us feel despair, um, I don't know about you, but there are those mornings where I think I can't get up in the morning. And in that moment, when despair has, has entered my body, um, I'm aware of the limits of my own imagination. What I've learned with Ross Donahue is imagination shared create collaboration. And in collaboration, we create community. And in community, anything is possible. So I, I want to introduce you with all the love in my heart to Ross Donahue, a first rate elegant cartographer. Ooh, wow. Um, thank you for those beautiful and inspiring words, Terry. And it's such an honor to be here and to be able to contribute in my very small way to this 
magnificent book and to the incredible work that you're doing. Um, it means so much. Um, so I live here in DC. Um, and like Terry said, I'm a cartographer, so I make maps. And um, really what what's driven me um, in, in my journey as a cartographer is this idea that we only save the places that we love and we only love the places that we know. And so if through my maps and digital media, people come to know um, and care for a place, then we have a better chance of protecting them. Um, and so, you know, this has been kind of a driving mantra for the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, um, as I've had the privilege to do amazing projects uh, where I get to work with um, such, such graceful and caring and passionate um, individuals making a difference around the world. Um, and this project was no different. Um, it's, it's, it gives me goosebumps just to think that, yeah, back in 2015, we were at that event and you told me I had a great aura around me and I just <laughs> lit up and I've been thinking about, um, I'm so glad I stood in line for, <laughs> for, for almost an hour because everybody wanted to talk with you. Um, so it's amazing and such an honor to be up here today. Um, and, you know, when we sat down during one of your trips through D.C., we had breakfast together, which, again, was incredible um, to be having breakfast with Terry Thomas Williams. But we went through and we went through a version of the map. And um, after we had gone through and, and come up with ideas for uh, the design direction, um, you talked a lot about patience and relationships. And I think that that has so much meaning um, for me in this work and as we think about conservation and landscape scale conservation and how it's not up to one individual um, to, to push forward with an idea, but it's through these collaborations and through these relationships that we build over years and years and years where we can make a difference. And, and this project really came out of that. Um, and I think it speaks to what's needed for for these big landscape scale conservation initiatives and and to see change in the world that we have. So I want to just take a couple more minutes to talk a little bit about the cartography and the process that um, went into creating this map. Um, I know you didn't come here to see me, and so I'll quickly exit the stage. But um, so, you know, from the beginning, um, one of the, you know, with any mapping project, it, it all starts with who's the audience and what's the purpose. Um, so you use that as kind of the framework for all of the design decisions, the design decisions that come after that. So that's anything from, you know, what font to use to what geographic features to incorporate. Um, and, and really, from the beginning, it's been about eroding public lands. So being able, to, being able to use a map to tell the story of the eroding public lands in Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante. Um, as, a, as a black and white map, um, there's the additional challenge of using visual cues other than color to be able to communicate that message and that story out to your audience. So you've got the gradients of white on one side and black on the other. And then you're using grays in between to be able to communicate information to your audience. And so for the readers of this book, it was really important to be able to communicate this huge um, you know, erosion of boundaries within Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante. And so that has more visual weight on the page so that communicates this message of you know, this is the most important part of this um, map. And then we also have, you know, reference, um, reference labels and, and reference boundaries so that readers can center themselves on, on where we're talking about in the world. And, and I think the element of any map that's really um, the most exciting is, is bringing out that information that really communicates this place. And, and what I mean by place is, it's those elements of a location that make it different from anywhere else in the world. It's those kind of sense, that sense of place that really kind of brings out um, what, this, what this landscape is all about. And so, you know, having 
a subtle relief um, incorporated into the map. So the relief is just the, the topography of this area was really important. Um, it's, it's wild and it's unlike any in the world. Um, having these major rivers that are these arteries flowing throughout. Um, and then incorporating these points of interest that are either mentioned in the book, um, things like Navajo Mountain or the Henry Mountains or Book Cliffs, um, having those points of interest that, you know, if you visit this place or if you have an intimate relationship with this location that, that everybody knows about. Um, and, you know, another amazing testament to, to Terry's um, vision for this was, um, you know, we were able to engage with a lot of um, uh, local coalitions, so the tribal coalitions, to be able to review the map before it goes to press to make sure that we were representing it correctly and, and incorporating those um, places and place names correctly. Um, and so that attention to detail really, really makes the map so much more meaningful. And that wouldn't have been possible without, you know, the vision that Terry had um, for this. And in doing so, it tells a more complete story and it, it matches, you know, the amazing text in, in the completeness and attention to detail in terms of um, Terry's craftsmanship in, in her writing. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you. <laughs> Thanks again for all this, um, you know, this opportunity. I want to also um, uh, just talk a little bit about Maps for Good. So Maps for Good is the, the company that myself and my colleague Marty Schnorr started. Um, she and I helped, you know, work together to craft this uh, map. And um, yeah, it's, it's just so exciting to be able to have these collaborations with amazing people like Terry. So thank you so much for all your work. It just moves me. I think that this intergenerational kind of work matters. And I think that's... Uh, It's what I've learned from my elders, um, like Marty Murray, or Stuart Udall, or Edward Abbey, or Wallace Stegner, or Rachel Carson. You know, you realize that we are all parts of this community, and each of us, in our own way, with the gifts that are ours, contribute. Um, and I know that each of you here contributes with the gifts that are yours. Um, in this community of, of conservationists, especially now. And in the broadest way that we can define conservation, that it, it is a generational stance. So it just means so much, Ross, that you're here and that we were able to do this. And I, I urge you to really look at the map um, in your private time to just see the stories that it really does tell. And it, it, it was a collaborative map with the tribes, with the Hopi, the Diné, Navajo, um, Ute, Mountain Ute, Ore Ute, and Zuni people. And um, I think those are important reference points, um, what was named and what was not named. Um, so there's a lot of empty spaces, but know that those empty spaces are sacred spaces as well. Um, this book matters to me because it's raw. It's not polished. Um, although I rewrote it more times than my husband would care to even talk about. He just said, do you care more about this or the eroding erosion of our marriage, you know? <laughs> because wherever I was, I kept reworking it. And I said, they're the same thing. You know, we are eroding and evolving at once, and especially now. So this book is a howl. I didn't care so much about the literary aspects, although I hope they're there. I cared about um, what was being discussed. And I felt that because this is such a raw time, these essays had to hold that same kind of rawness and emotion and honesty. It's a howl. I view this book as a howl. 
And I also feel that I was writing toward the future, that I want the future to know that there were those of us, a lot of us, millions and millions of people on this planet, maybe even billions, that care about what's happening right now. And more and more I'm thinking about that. And I think about how I once wrote, the eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are praying that we might see beyond our own time. And we are seeing a, an administration that is only seeing I don't have the words. Um, I really don't have the words. But we feel it. And we will get through this. And I'm grateful for the courts at this moment in time. Um, so I write with this sense of wild mercy as witness. And I was interested, um, a couple of weeks ago, the National Parks Conservation Association listed the 12 most endangered national parks. And I want to read them. Um, and this is, they're endangered because of oil and gas development. Chaco Canyon, Hovenweep, Bears Ears, Mesa Verde, Theodore Roosevelt, Canyonlands, Great Sand Dunes, Rocky Mountains, Big Cypress, Grand Teton, Carlsbad Cavern, Dinosaur National Monument, and Sequoia National Park. Out of those 12 national parks, 11 of them are in the American West. Out of those 12 national parks and monuments, eight of them are in the Southwest. And out of those 12 national parks and monuments that are threatened, one third of them are in Utah. That's where we are. We are eroding and evolving together. All souls come here to rub the sharp edges off each other. This isn't suffering, it is erosion. Chuck Palahniuk, The Fight Club. Someone said, why did you choose a quote from him? Um, <laughs> And he has been aligned with a different politics than my own. But it's for that reason, because I think ultimately this isn't about um, Republicans or Democrats or right versus left, but who we are as human beings um, who care about this place and the dignity of, um, of justice, not just for our species, but all species. So we heard Ross talk about the physical map. And I want to just create a visual map for you of where I come from. I live in an erosional landscape in the Red Rock Desert of southeastern Utah, very near the Four Corners region where you know they share a common boundary point of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. We live in a small desert hamlet of about 250 people, um, 30 miles east of Moab, Utah, along the Colorado River. Um, if we were standing on our porch right now, uh, which I like to think that we are, um, to the south rise the LaSalle Mountains. They're covered in snow right now, early. Um, the Aspens having just fallen from their golden state. Um, these mountains are 12,000 feet above sea level. To the north is the Colorado River running red with the sediment of the canyon country. Um, to the west is Porcupine Rim. Uh, that holds the last light of day. And to the east, in the rising sun, is this extraordinary uh, freestanding tower called Castleton Tower, 400 feet tall, um, made out of Wingate sandstone. How many of you have seen that before? It's a stunning structure, um, geologic form. And right to the north of that is a configuration out of sandstone created out of erosion that we call the priest and nuns. So that's where I, I come from. Not long ago, a friend of ours called and said, would it be okay if I brought a, a new love interest 
for lack of a better word, um, to come visit you. And Brooke and I said, we would love that, please. We'll have dinner, Brooke will cook, I'll set the table. And they came, and we had what I would say was just a wonderful evening, getting to know each other. We went on a beautiful walk, um, we called the Circle Walk at the base of Castleton Tower. Um, we laid on the porch, looking up at the Milky Way, and I thought it was a very successful evening so to speak, among friends. We all went to bed. You know, they retired in the guest room. And what I thought was in the middle of the night, I heard sort of a um, stirring. So I put on my robe and got up. And there was our friend's new friend, um, dressed, her bags packed, ready to leave. And I said, are you okay? And she said, no, I need to get out of here. And I said, I didn't know what to say. And she said, it's too far away. It's too wild. It's too dark. It's too quiet. It's too everything. And the next thing I saw our friend, you know, kind of shuffling around, you know, dressed. And they walked out the door. And Brooke came in, you know, quickly. And we walked them out to their car. And as they were, they turned on the motor, they were ready to go. Literally, dawn was just starting to break. And she rolled down her window and she said, Terry, aren't you afraid you'll be forgotten? Did I say they're from Manhattan? <laughs> so, <laughs> I meant to. Um, what I wanted to say is, I hope so. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is enough for me, and we will all be forgotten. Uh, but I didn't, and when they drove away, that question really stuck with me. Aren't you afraid you'll be forgotten? And what I realized is, no, I'm not afraid I will be forgotten. I will be. What I'm afraid is what I might forget. And what I'm afraid I will forget is that the world is so beautiful. That this beautiful broken world is alive. Remember Castleton Tower, that 400 foot sandstone spire that presides over our valley. This just the last month or so, from Science News and the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America. Quote, at about the same rate that your heart beats, a Utah rock formation called Castleton Tower gently vibrates, keeping time and keeping watch over the sandstone desert. Swaying like a skyscraper, the red rock tower taps into the deep vibrations of the earth. Wind, waves, and far-off earthquakes are registered. New research from University of Utah geologists details the natural vibration, heartbeat, pulse of the tower. This is scientific writing. Quote, we often view such grand and prominent landforms as permanent features of our landscape, when in reality they are continuously moving and evolving, says Riley Finnegan, a graduate student and co-author of the paper. And then this, Castleton Tower is a spire of Wingate sandstone nearly 400 feet tall that stands over Utah's Castle Valley, the largest, I did not know this, freestanding rock tower in the world. And then from Jeff Moore, the lead scientist, quote, most people are in awe of its static stability. In its dramatic freestanding nature, perched at the end of a ridge overlooking Castle Valley, it has a kind of stoic power in its appearance. What we couldn't have imagined is that it has a pulse. Let's listen now to the pulse of Castleton Tower. What those of us in the valley have always intuited, what native people have always known in our area, and what science has just verified.
you, you're gonna have to really listen. Can you hear what seems like a growl? And then if we just bear with this, you can start to hear a beat. If you Google Castleton Tower Pulse, Utah, you'll be able to find that for yourself and hold it up to your ear. The earth is alive. Castleton Tower has a pulse. Stone has a pulse. We have a pulse. The earth has a pulse. There are no beautiful surfaces without a terrible depth. And that's the shadow side. That we know on one hand the earth is alive. Stone bears a pulse even as our own. On the other hand, there is this terrible violence. And what I can tell you is I have a friend named Fuzzle Sheikh, who is a photographer he is of Muslim descent. And after September 11th, where I was here in this room, um, in community, when that happened, he no longer felt safe and needed more spaciousness in his life, and he moved to Switzerland. He has photographed conflict zones all around the world, from Rwanda to Pakistan to... Palestine, Israel, Bedouin countries, looking at the surfaces of the earth from an aerial point of view. His work is extraordinary. We met at Dartmouth um, two years ago. I did not know him. I knew his work. And over a cup of coffee, I remember saying, why don't you come home? And he looked at me and said, what? And I said, why are you traveling all over the world when we have serious conflicts here. Come home. Why don't you come to Utah? He looked at me as though I was half mad, and the rest of the coffee did not go so well, and he left. And I thought maybe I had overstepped my bounds. About three months later, the phone rang. I was in Castle Valley. I picked up the phone, and he said, God damn you. And I thought it was our neighbor. <laughs> and then he said, Fuzzle Shake, can I still come? And he came to Utah, and he's there now on our porch. And he's doing extraordinary work with the tribes from this aerial perspective, looking at incursions, to use his word, not mine. But about a year and a half ago, he called me after being... Um, out photographing for about four months. And he said, Terry, I am really shaken. And he said, this is the most violent place I have ever been. And I became defensive. And then I realized I had been in denial. And this was my um, text to him, actually, a bit changed, but that's the seedbed of this piece I'm going to read to you. What is beauty, if not stillness? What is stillness, if not sight? What is sight, if not an awakening? What is an awakening, if not now? The American landscape is under assault by an administration that cares only about themselves. 
working behind closed doors. They are strategically undermining environmental protections that have been in place for decades, and they are getting away with it. In practices of secrecy, in deeds of greed, in acts of violence that are causing pain. Like many, I have compartmentalized my state of mind in order to survive. Like most, I have also compartmentalized my state of Utah. It is a violence hidden that we all share. This is the fallout that has entered our bodies. Nuclear bombs tested in the desert. Boom. These are uranium tailings left on the edges of our towns where children play. Boom. The war games played and nerve gas stored in the West Desert. Boom. These are the oil and gas lines, frack lines, from Vernal to Bonanza in the Uinta Basin. Boom. This is Aneth and Montezuma Creek, the oil patches on Indian lands. Boom. Gut bear's ears. Boom. Cut Grand Staircase Escalante in half. Boom. And every other wild place that is easier for me to defend than my own people and species. Boom. The coal and copper mines I watched expand as a child, Huntington and Kennecott, boom. The oil refineries that foul the air and blacken our lungs in Salt Lake City, boom. And the latest scar in the landscape, the tar sands mine in the book cliffs, closed, now hidden, simply by its remoteness, boom. Add the Cisco Desert where trains stop to settle the radioactive Waste they carry on to Blanding, boom. Move the uranium tailings from Moab to Crescent Junction, then bury it, still hot, in the alkaline desert, out of sight, out of mind, boom. See the traces of human indignities on the sands near Topaz Mountain, left by the Japanese internment camps, boom. President Donald J. Trump will try to eviscerate Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante monuments with his pen and poisonous policies. He will stand tall with other white men who for generations have exhumed, looted, and profited from the graves of the ancient ones. They will tell you Bears Ears belongs to them. Boom. Consider Senator Orrin Hatch's words regarding the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition support of the Bears Ears National Monument. Quote, the Indians, while they don't fully understand that a lot of the things they are currently enjoying and taking for granted on those lands, well, they won't be able to do it if it's made clearly into a monument. Unquote. And when he was asked to give examples by journalists, the senator said, quote, just take my word for it. Unquote. This is a story, a patronizing story, a condescending story. I see politicians and frontier Mormons discounting the tribes once again, calling them, quote, Lamanites, unquote, the rebellious ones against God, dark-skinned and cursed. That is their story. Racism is their story. The Book of Mormon is a story. Boom. Perhaps our greatest trauma living in the state of Utah is the religiosity of the Mormon patriarchy that says you have no authority to speak. Women, Indians, black people, brown people, gay people, trans people, it is only the chosen ones who hold the priesthood over us and counsel us that the only way to heaven is through them. All my life, I was told I could not speak that I had no voice, no power, except through my father or my husband or my bishop or the general authorities, and then there was the prophet. Boom. I refused to perpetuate this lie, this myth, this abuse called silence. If birds had a voice, so did I. I would tell a different story, one of beauty and abundance, not what it means to endure. Environmental racism is the outcome of bad stories, a byproduct of poverty. In Utah, yellow cake has dusted the lips of Navajo uranium workers for decades who are now sick or dead. Boom. There is no running water in Westwater, a reservation town adjacent to Blanding. Local municipalities refuse to provide Navajo families with the basic human right. Water. Boom. But we are not prejudiced. Boom. If you speak of these oversights, call them cruelties. We, as Mormons, I am a Mormon, are seen as having betrayed our roots and our people. These are my people. Boom. This is who I am. Boom. A white woman of privilege, born of the covenant. I am not on the outside. I am on the inside. Boom. It is time to look in the mirror and reflect on these histories that are ours. Violent histories that are ours. Boom.
We are being told a treacherous story that says it is an individual's right, our hallowed state's right, to destroy what is common to us all, the land beneath our feet, the water we drink, the air we breathe. Our bodies and the body of the state of Utah are being violated. Our eyes are closed, our mouths are sealed. We refuse to see or say what we know to be true. Utah is a beautiful violence. Do we dare to see Utah for what it is, an elegant toxic landscape where the power of oppression rules by repression, our proving grounds of fear? What are we afraid of? Exposure, boom. Our denial is our collusion, our silence is our death. The climate is changing. We have a right and responsibility to protect each other. Resistance and insistence before the law. We are dying, we are ignoring the evidence. Awareness is our prayer. Engagement is a prayer. Beauty will prevail. Native people are showing us the way. It is time to heal these lands and each other by calling them what they are, sacred. May wing beats of ravens cross over us in ceremony. May we recognize our need of a collective blessing by earth. May we ask forgiveness for our wounding of land and spirit. And may our right relationship to life be restored as we work together toward a survival shared. A story is awakening. We are part of something so much larger than ourselves. Many stories are awakening. An interconnected whole that stretches upward toward the stars. Coyote in the desert is howling in the darkness, calling forth the pack, lifting up the moon. When I asked Willie Gray Eyes, who is a powerful community leader who lives at Navajo Mountain, shortly after this administration gutted Bear's Ears, I said to Willie, what do we do with our anger? What do you do with your anger? And he looked at me and he said, Terry, it can no longer be about anger. It has to be about healing. It can no longer be about anger. It has to be about healing. And when I pressed him, he said, what I mean is, if you have a sliver in the heel of your foot and you don't know where the source of your pain is, then you can never heal. So I would ask us today, what is the source of our anger? What is the source of our pain? And how might we begin to heal? As a nation, as a people, a diverse people, in a diverse country, whether it's reparations, whether it's apologies to Native people, even the apologies within our own families, it can no longer be about anger. It has to be about healing. Three more minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Jonah Yellowman is a medicine person, Diné, who lives out in Monument Valley. No water, no utilities. And not long ago, I went to visit him, and I said, Jonah, what are you hearing? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? We've known each other for decades, and I love him. And he said, Terry, we are in ceremony. And what my elders are telling me, he said, and he's in his 70s, is we have to go deeper. So that's the other thing I would ask us to consider. What does it mean to go deeper, each in our own way, with the work that is ours? Perhaps Jonah's call to go deeper is a call to acknowledge the power that resides in the earth itself, in our own hearts. The earth has a pulse, and so do we. The organic intelligences inherent in deserts and forests, rivers and oceans, and all manner of species beyond our own, even within the urban landscapes, especially within our urban landscapes. We cannot create wild nature. We can only destroy it. And in the end, in breathtaking acts of repentance and renewal, try to restore what we have thoughtlessly removed at our own expense. Be it wolves in the Yellowstone or willows and willow flycatchers along the Colorado River, 
or the brave red foxes and coyotes and raccoons that infiltrate our cities, even here. Where I live, the desert is a place of power, and anyone who has walked this erosional landscape of buttes and mesas and experienced the embrace of red rock canyons, animated by the handprints of the ancient ones, carefully placed on sandstone walls, rising upward to a starlit sky, cannot stand by and be witness to its demise by those who care only for what the land can produce. Bless you. The real estate that can be sold or the commodity it can become. Utah's Red Rock Desert, as vulnerable as it is now, and I promise you, if we had a raven's point of view, it looks like an exposed nervous system. These lands will survive without us, with or without presidential proclamations. But the truth is, we may not survive without them. So last thoughts. How do we find the strength to not look away at all that is breaking our hearts? It can no longer be about anger. It has to be about healing. We have to go deeper. What has been weathered and whittled away is as beautiful as what remains. Erosion, rock being worn down to its essence. We are being worn down to our essence. We are eroding and evolving at once, together. We need not lose hope. We just need to locate where it dwells. Castleton Tower has a pulse. We have a pulse. The pulse of the planet is in our hands. Engagement is a prayer. How serious are we? Boom. Thank you for staying. And Ross and I are here to answer questions or ponder them with you. Tess. And um, will you introduce I'll, yourself to us? My name is Bruce. Um, I'm not familiar with you or your work. And so I've heard a lot of thank yous and booms and stuff, but I never got a statement of what's your book about. <laughs> um, it's about boom. It's about erosion. It's about um, what's being lost on the desert lands. It's about this is a landscape where nuclear testing has occurred. This is a landscape where uranium mine tailings dwell. This is a landscape where the rivers are running hot. This is a landscape where injustices continue to happen at the expense of public health. This is the land that is being gutted and eroded by this particular administration through oil and gas drilling. This is a landscape that is so fragile it bears the scars for generations. That's what this book is about. It's about the erosion of democracy. It's about the erosion of public lands. It's about the erosion of self. It's about the erosion of the body, even my brother's death by suicide. So I'm local here my whole life, and I don't plan immediately to go out there maybe to ski. But anyway, can you tell Washingtonians here some things that we might be able to help with? Yes, thank you. Um, supporting the tribes through organizations like Utah Dene Bikea, um, or finding out what's happening with um, the Utah Inter, you know, the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. Um, as we speak, and I'll make this quick, Willie Gray Eyes, um, a few years ago, two years ago, saw the racial gerrymandering that had taken place in San Juan County, one of the largest counties in America. And he filed suit, he won his case, and when that open space of democracy became available, he ran for office and he won as county commissioner with Ken Maryboy, creating for the first time in Utah's history, a native majority, an indigenous majority. That was not to be stood for among what I call the frontier Mormons. And Kelly Laws um, said, this is an illegitimate candidate, in an illegitimate race because he is not a resident of the state of Utah. Willie Gray Eyes, Diné, whose generations after generations, the family, the Gray Eyes, have lived in the shadow of Navajo Mountain. The trial of Willie Gray Eyes is in this book. It is unbelievable. 
Um, what Willie taught all of us is that in the midst of a newly appointed Trump judge, Judge Torgerson, um, in the midst of very high-powered lawyers, white lawyers, who said he is not a resident, and here's why. Um, they said he lived in Arizona. They said he lived in a trailer. They said he had a girlfriend. They followed him violating tribal law on and on and on. At, at lunch, we were all worried. Do you know what Willie Gray Eyes's defense was? He could have shown, showed his 35 plus years of Utah voting records. He could have shown the work he had done community in terms of health care, education, food for elders. Do you know what his defense was? I, Willie Gray Eyes, am a resident of the state of Utah because this is where my umbilical cord is buried. <clears throat> And medicine people spoke. His daughter spoke. And I just want to, um, it will take two minutes and we still have time for questions. This was what his daughter said. The pros prosecuting attorney faced April Wilkerson, his daughter, and demanded to know, demanded to know where Willie Gray Eyes lives and sleeps. Because when he gave quadrants of where he lives and sleeps, they went out there and there were no structures. <laughs> It was where his umbil umbilical cord was buried. You want to know where my father lives? He lives in his car, 800,000 miles on his car, helping tribal members. You want to know where my father lives? He sometimes lives with me at my cabin at Navajo Mountain. He sometimes lives with his sister Rose and sleeps under a shade hut on Paiute Ma Mesa. You want to know why my father has no dwelling? Because he didn't want to take advantage of his position. But you ask where my father really sleeps? He has a horse, he puts out his bedroll, and he sleeps on the land where his umbilical cord is buried. April Wilkerson looked at the judge. My father's home is the land. What was the decision in the state of Utah? On Tuesday, January 29th, 2019, Judge Don M. Torgerson gave his ruling from Utah's 7th District Court, quote, Willie Gray Eyes is indeed a resident of San Juan County who lives on the Utah side of Navajo Mountain. The ruling says, and I quote, Willie Gray Eyes is also from Paiute Mesa in the traditional sense. He was raised there. His umbilical cord is buried there and his family counts that area as their place of origin. Judge Torgerson wrote in the last sentences, Willie Gray Eyes is as connected to San Juan County as deeply as any resident of this country. In practice, more so. He has always participated in the voting process in San Juan County, and his rich cultural history adds to his connection. He has always returned to the area and will always intend to return to the area when he has traveled away. May I suggest we have a great deal to learn from Mr. Gray Eyes about what it means to dwell in place. We can support um, the tribal organizations, Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, Grand Canyon Trust um, are all making a difference. And the Utah Rural Project is now um, every indigenous home in San Juan County has an address so they can vote. So thank you for that question. Did you have a, a question? Basically, you answered it. I was, I was really going to ask uh, about the, the possibilities for both a judicial and political uh, event with actions uh, making a difference. It's made a huge difference. And, you know, I've been a conservationist in Utah all my life. I realize how superficial my work has been. And at my debts are, are so large in this last decade of working particularly with Native people on this Bears Ears issue. And, and to be an ally, a good ally, um, has taught me so much. And I think for the first time, white, privileged environmentalists in the state of Utah are listening. And we are being changed by this. And the last thing I will tell you, and then we can, um, I'll read one very small paragraph. I would be remiss if I left you with the note that all is well. Um, after Willie won the case, the Navajo majority stood. Um, 
the Utah Republicans, governor all the way down, went to Louisiana, adopted their segregationist bill, and just on Tuesday, um, before San Juan County, was Proposition 10 that said, we will have two separate San Juan counties, an Indian county and a white county, which meant a Mormon county. That proposition lost. And San Juan County is united. The tribes are asking for a healing. And this is the best news I can imagine in a state that has been deeply, religiously, politically racist. Ter Terry? Yes. Could I just ask a generalized question? Yes. Thank you for your graceful life's work. But uh, it seems to me that it, even in geology, there's a there's a form of uh, mythology, even in the whether it's in its derivation from its Latin Greek roots or whatever. And I'm just wondering, with all you know, we if we can think of a new mythology that incorporates so much that is in, in embedded in that geology, in, in the thinking about the Earth, the Gaia, whatever principles we we occupy by, wherever it comes from get a sort of a uniform, a, un, a unifying principle of mythology that can spread like the, the, the wings, you know? And we can keep those images in our mind without them fading and being diluted by, you know, by fracking or whatever other fricking stuff goes on, okay? I mean, I'm just wondering if you've been able to see something of that sort that looms large that can really be in our minds in terms of mythology. I think you've given us that in a very beautiful way. Um, and I think it's this idea that we are engaged, all of us, um, in the places we call home, that, that there are many, many stories that have not been heard that are being heard now. And I am learning how to be uh, quieter. Thank you.